तुम बता देना गुड मॉर्निंग ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द नेहरू साइंस सेंटर एंड द नेशनल काउंसिल ऑफ साइंस म्यूजियम मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ कल्चर गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इट गिव्स अस इमेंस प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर टूडेज लेक्चर वी हैव विथ अस professor good morning the who on behalf of the nehru the science center, center, nehru science hmm. center hmm. and the hmm. national council of science museum and also the respected government of india member of the governing body uh, of the national council of science museum um he is here with us uh, he'll be speaking on uh, the rakhi gadi excavation i'm sure you must have uh, for the past uh, one or two months um couple of months back you must have heard uh, we must have read in uh, about the rakhi gadi excavation Uh, it so happened that uh, for the first time i mean at least in my memory i saw the science news getting covered on the front pages of the times of india and that news was nothing but the excavation of uh, the rakhi gadi professor shinde um, is uh, was the former vice chancellor of uh, the deccan college uh, he has about four decades of uh, experience uh, in uh, teaching primarily in um, uh, deccan college uh, um he has excavated um, sites in maharashtra rajasthan um, of course now for the past 7 8 years uh, he has been excavating the rakhi gadi site which is in the news um, um professor the shinde has uh, an honor of working with um, oxford cambridge universities in us universities in um, japan uh, korea and several other things he has guided uh, more than 40 research students has uh, several books and publication hundreds of publications both national and international to his credit i am not going to stand before you and uh, professor uh, wasant shinde sir may i on behalf of the nehru science center and the national council of science museum request you to please uh, deliver your uh, lecture sir namaste uh, thank you very much uh, dr shiv prasad uh, kenerji uh, i am extremely happy to come online and talk about the excavations at rakhi gadi let me tell you before i begin let me tell uh, the audience about the nehru science center now this center is uh, very important in the country because you know they are trying to take science to every home and uh, you know they are making efforts to generate this scientific temper in the country and i am extremely happy to be associated with these type of centers uh, they are trying to blend the modern science and the ancient science and that is really required for the country so i take this opportunity to thank uh, dr kenneth and the uh, all the other staff of the nehru science center and particularly saket because you know he is arranging all this <laughs> uh, important uh, online meeting Uh, i welcome all the uh, people online and uh, i will certainly begin we you know uh, with the namaste tradition now the world has realized the importance of this namaste tradition and let me tell the audience that uh, this particular tradition was started by the harappans there is a site called rakhi uh, kalibanga in the saraswati basin and this site has produced some terracotta figurines human terracotta figurines showing in namaste position so this tradition goes back to the harappan times and today the entire world has realized the importance of uh, because of the uh, you know corona virus the importance of this particular indian tradition so with this you know i will uh, start uh, my uh, presentation now friends let me show you the uh, the team uh, uh, excavation team at the site of rakhi gadi now this work was carried out in collaboration with the uh, 
Haryana State Department of Archaeology, and there were a number of scientists from different parts of the world, which were associated with this excavation for carrying out some scientific uh, analysis. And uh, we have published some of the important scientific analysis. Now, all of you know that you know the Harappan civilization was discovered in 1920s. The excavation started at the site of Harappa and Mohanjo-daro simultaneously in 1920s. And uh, some of the, you know, of course, this was done under the direction of the then Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India, Sir Mortimer, uh, Sir uh, John Marshall. Uh, but some of the Indian scholars like uh, Rakhal Dal Banerjee, uh, Madhav Swarup was, they have contributed immensely uh, in un unraveling the history of the Harappan civilization. Now today, this year, in fact, we are celebrating 100 years of the discovery of the Harappan civilization. Uh, let me tell you the importance of the discovery, in fact, in 1920s. It was, the excursion started in 1920, but the actual identification of the Harappan civilization, Harappan culture, was made in 1924. In fact, you know, the first paper announcing the discovery of the Harappan civilization was published on 20th September 1924 in Illustrated London News by Sir John Marshall. And that is how the world came to know about the discovery of the Harappan civilization. So that is one you know, important, uh, and this was considered to be the most uh, important archaeological discovery in the world in, the, you know, in, in that time. And uh, we have been working on this Harappan civilization for last almost 100 years, and we have generated enough data to discuss about the life of the Harappans, some of the social organizations, maybe political organization of the Harappan people, Harappan culture. And after exactly after 100 years, uh, we have uh, made a major breakthrough research on the uh, uh, Harappan people. For the first time, uh, we have discussed about the who are the Harappan people, because these are some of the questions which were not answered scientifically by the scientific community. And therefore, this is considered to be the most important breakthrough research. So th that has come exactly after 100 years. Now, uh, we use two terms. One is the Harappan culture, and the other one is Harappan civilization. Uh, when it comes to the culture, the time span of this particular culture now is from 5500 BC to 1500 BC. This is the entire time span of the Harappan culture. And there is one phase of the Harappan culture from 2600 BC to 1900 BC, uh, which is the most prosperous phase of the Harappan culture, in which we see the uh, development of urbanization, cities and towns were developed. And that particular phase is called the phase of the civilization. So, you know, these are the two important uh, terms that no one should understand. Then when it comes to the Harappan culture or Harappan civilization, there are at least four, four different terms used for the same culture, same you know, civilization. When it was discovered or identified at the site of Harappa, it was called the Harappan culture, Harappan civilization. And later, you know, the uh, research was mainly around the site of Mohanjadaro, which was the biggest Harappan city that time. And number of sites were located in the Indus River Basin and most of the then scholars thought that the Harappan culture or civilization is confined to the Indus Basin. And therefore, they say that instead of calling it as Harappan culture or civilization, uh, let's use the term Indus culture or Indus civilization. And after the 1950s, when the Indian scholars, particularly Amnananda Ghosh, and uh, his colleagues from the Archaeological Survey of India, they discovered a number of sites in the Saraswati Basin. Uh, then, you know, it was clear that, you know, that this particular culture or civilization 
was not confined to the indus river basin and it is going beyond that and still you know some of the scholars believe that the saraswati basin is a part of the greater indus river basin and therefore the term like indus valley civilization was introduced by some scholars and in 80s because you know by 80s the distribution of the harappan civilization the harappan culture was very clear and we notice many sites in the saraswati basin today if you see the scenario nearly two third of the harappan settlements are located in the saraswati basin and therefore some of the indian scholars they thought that you know it is not right or we do not just do the justice to the harappan civilization and therefore you know the world you know saraswati should be also included in the term and therefore indus saraswati civilization this particular term was used after 1980s so these are the three four different terms which are being used for the same culture and it definitely you know uh, creates a lot of confusion for the students or the common people who are not really specialized in you know, a specialist in the subject and therefore you know to avoid this confusion we stick to the basics and we go back to the first term that is used in fact uh, by the archaeologists that is the harappan culture and harappan civilization and this is the you know this is the logic in pattern which we use in pattern archaeology wherever whenever your culture is discovered at any site that particular culture is you know named after that site that village or maybe river basin so we are going back to the basics of archaeology and therefore we are using the term harappan culture and the harappan civilization now many of you may not be aware that uh, the reconstruction of the harappan history is very much biased because the history is based on the data coming from mainly from harappa mohenjodaro rakigadi and dolavira these are the sites you know which are excavated on large scale and these are the sites you know which were the harappan cities and friends let me tell you that you now we have discovered nearly 2000 or more than 2000 harappan sites today and out of 2000 there are only five harappan cities and there may be maybe one dozen harappan towns whereas most of the other settlements they are in different categories there are large number of harappan villages or the farming settlements there are harappan ports there are harappan maybe manufacturing centers even small temporary settlements so these are the different categories and we archaeologists harappan archaeologists have not really excavated the sites of different categories on large scale we have only you know maybe excavated sites of the you know harappan cities on large scale and what we know today is the city life of the harappan people but we do not have really holistic understanding about the harappan history and therefore i believe that you know this is the bias reconstruction of the harappan history and therefore from here onward we need to give more emphasis on studying the small site or small site archaeology needs to be done so that we generate more data uh, to reconstruct the holistic harappan history and then you will ask me why then i am excavating the harappan city again because even though i know the problem why i am doing this particular site so let me tell you that uh, when i was excavating a harappan town called uh, farmana which is in the same saraswati basin roughly 30 km away from the site of rakigadi and i excavated that site for four years and every year in fact now i used to take the students to rakigadi to show the site in fact to the students and every time i used to go there i used to you know notice that there is more and more encroachment happening on the site more destruction happening to, to the site even though the major part of the site is protected by the archaeological survey of india people still you know were destroying the site and i realized that you now if we do not start the research at this particular site 
perhaps one day we will lose the greatest harappan city or perhaps the greatest maybe cultural treasure of the country and therefore i decided to go to the site of rakigadi and start the excavation of course i have excavated you know maybe three or four small sites and they have certainly produced you know, very important evidence uh, which uh, you know we have used for reconstructing the history of the harappan culture and the harappan civilization now we had three major goals in fact at the site of rakigadi these are the research goals i am talking to you uh, besides these three research goals uh, it is also proposed to develop the site from tourism point of view also and uh, there are two aspects of the tourism point of view uh, development one is that you know we are planning we are not done that so far we are planning to excavate part of the city we are not really planning a large scale excavation because we know you know that uh, it will be difficult to manage you know this large scale excavation because uh, you know there will be great challenge for all of us to preserve the structures that will be excavated and here you know most of the structures are either mud structures or mud brick structures and in india in fact you know we do not have specialty in the protection and preservation of the mud brick or the mud structures in the country uh when i visited the site of mohenjodaro twice first i visited uh, mohenjodaro in 2012 and i noticed that the site was really you know, in a bad state and again i was invited in 2017 and that time i could notice that even though most of the structures at mohenjodaro are made of burnt bricks it is very difficult for pakistan government and for the pakistan archaeologists to maintain that site and uh, even uh, the world heritage you know which has given the status of the world heritage site so uh, that committee has threatened the government that unless you take care of the site uh, we will otherwise we will withdraw the status so we don't want you know and we know you know maybe we have quite good understanding about the harappan or the uh, city type of the harappans so even if we even if we excavate the site on large scale we are generating we are going to generate the same kind of data that you know as we have in fact at the site of harappa and mohenjodaro so we do do not want to excavate you know the site on large scale uh but we are part targeting the uh you know research based excavation at the site so only you know the the excavation is undertaking are undertaken to maybe take care of the research problem that we have so the first problem that we have you know research problem is that you know we had no idea about the total area of the site uh, there were different opinions in fact some of the scholars say that maybe it is 50 hectare some say that maybe it is 80 hectare some say that maybe it is more than 200 hectare so these were the guesswork you know done by the uh, some of the earlier archaeologists and nobody tried to really you know calculate the total area scientifically so we spent two years in fact in we we started the excavation at the site sorry the research <coughs> uh, work at the site in 2011 and 2011 and 12 this two years we spent only in calculating the total area of the site and before this calculation the site of rakigadi was placed third largest harappan city the first was the site of mohenjodaro the second was the site of harappa and third was the site of rakigadi and today the area that you know we have calculated much larger part of that of course is uh, uh, is destroyed by the you know local people but you know we have done this scientific calculation and the total area is coming to around 550 hectare so this is almost double the size of mohenjodaro but still you know we are not really excited because we don't know whether this total area that we see today whether that area was brought under occupation at one and the same time or gradually you know from period to period that is not clear and we are working on this particular aspect so this is one one very, very important uh, uh, problem that you know we have already worked on the second problem was to uh, understand the transformation 
from culture to civilization from the beginning of the harappan culture to the you know civilization state of the harappan harappan culture and uh, this was the ideal candidate the site of rakhigadi because we have the early harappan people as ah uh, अच्छा शेयर नहीं किया अभी हाँ नहीं मैं 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 कर रहा हूँ मैं वो कर रहा हूँ हाँ वो आई एम डूइंग दैट सो यू नो दी ट्रां बिकॉज़ यू नो वी नो दैट यू नो दिस पर्टिकुलर साइट हैज दी अर्लीर अपन फेज एंड आई वाज मेंशनिंग दैट यू नो दिस देर आर थ्री फेजेस ऑफ दी कल्चर आईडेंटिफाइड one is the early harappan phase which is roughly from 5500 bc to 2600 bc the second of course is the you know the what we call as the mature harappan or the phase of the harappan civilization that is from 2600 bc to 1900 bc and then of course there is a decline phase of the decadent phase of the harappan culture which is you know from 1900 bc to 1500 bc and that phase is called the late harappan phase so here in fact at the site of rakhigadi we have a thick deposit of the early harappan and also of the harappan civilization phase and therefore you know it was easy for us to study the transformation from the beginning to the civilization phase then uh, we also want to understand who are the harappan people because as far as the origin of the harappan culture is concerned there are different hypotheses given by different scholars and uh, we did not have sufficient uh, maybe scientific data to talk about the harappan people so some people say that maybe you know people came from the west particularly from the from mesopotamia and these are the people who established the harappan culture and harappan civilization in the indian subcontinent some say that maybe you know people came from maybe middle east maybe from iran from steppe region etc and uh, but there was no scientific data on that and therefore you know we wanted to resolve this particular issue and therefore you know we undertook the dna research at the site of rakhigadi so we have some idea about the harappan people today and also so this dna research uh, even though lot of scholars tried earlier uh, they did not succeed but perhaps this is the first time that we have succeeded in in getting the dna of the harappan people and we can shed some light on the harappan people and lastly you know how do these people look like this also was a big question and for the first time you know, we did we used this forensic science uh, to understand or to reconstruct the uh, 3d feature of the harappan people so i am going to show how the harappan people also look like so these were some of the major research goals that we had and uh, you know we have achieved quite you know great success in this then we also have used a lot of scientific methods for recording for analysis of data and uh, also you know uh, scientific method methods like gps survey ground penetration radar survey then dna research dna science research then forensic science research then we have also you know undertaken the stable isotope stars grain and residue analysis of the harappan you know people i am going to discuss that part uh, in great detail later so in this map uh, you can see uh, the harappan area and uh, also the uh, contemporary mesopotamian area so here you know the uh, portion that you see in red mostly the harappan culture and civilization spread in the north west part of the indian subcontinent so it covers you know some parts of pakistan like you know sindh area baluchistan and punjab province of pakistan and in india the harappan sites are located from the jammu uh, from jammu to uh, through punjab indian part of punjab then entire haryana then the western part of rajasthan entire gujarat and up to the gujarat and maharashtra border 
So this is the area in Patna, and, and on the western side now it is up to the Makran coast. So very large area in fact, you know, more than almost two million square kilometer area was occupied, which is almost double the size of Pakistan. And here in fact, in the map, you can see in fact, in green, this is the area of the contemporary, uh, you know, this uh, Sumerian or the Mesopotamian civilization. The Mesopotamian civilization was confined, of course, to a very small area, uh, maybe, you know, between Tigris and Euphrates in Iraq, and also part of Iran, the Elam region of Iran. So similarly, you know, in this map, the area of the uh, Egyptian civilization is not clear, but Egyptian civilization also is very small, you know, mostly in the middle of the, uh, you know, this Nile River. Whereas the Indian, uh, the Harappan civilization was truly international right from the beginning. We see the Harappan sites, you know, up to the Iranian border uh, in the north, up to the western part of UP, you know, to the east, up to the Gujarat and border, you know, so Maharashtra border in south, and the Makran coast. So very large area was, you know, brought under occupation by the Harappan people. And uh, let me also tell you that uh, uh, over this area, almost 2 million square kilometer area, the Harappans at one stage, you know, they integrated, you know, the entire Harappan, you know, uh, culture. And they created, in fact, the uniform or the standardized, uh, you know, culture over such a large area. In the early Harappan phase, there were a number of regional, uh, maybe early Harappan cultures. So they integrated all these in, you know, regional early Arab cultures and created sort of empire or a nation, in fact, around 2600 BC, perhaps the earliest anywhere in fact in the world. So this is the you know, area of the Harappan culture. And today, uh, after the partition, you know, there were only two sites on the Indian, Indian side. One was the site of Rangpur in Gujarat, uh, in the Saurashtra part of Gujarat here. And the other was the Kotla Nyang Khan in Punjab, these were the two sites known uh, on the Indian side uh, after the partition. And most of the other sites went to Pakistan. But today, let me tell you, because of the efforts of the archaeological sort of India and uh, various universities like Deccan College, Kurukshetra University, Baroda University, uh, and various other universities, today we can see that there is uh, a large number of sites discovered in the on the Indian side, and uh, out of 2,000 sites that have been discovered so far, nearly 1,500 sites are located on the Indian side, and uh, maybe 500 sites on the Pakistan side. So you can see that you know that uh, the larger part of the uh, Indian northwest part of the uh, part of India was uh, was brought under occupation. So from this map. Uh, you can get the idea, in fact, what was the total area. Uh, we have some sites, you know, mostly along the Makran coast, and there are 30 sites, in fact, here. Hello? Like, have problem over I goes? Dubara, we can connect again. साकेत मुझे बताओ कहाँ तक वो क्लियर था हेलो हेलो नहीं अभी क्या करना है वो फिर से शुरू करना है क्या ओके वो मुझे हाँ ठीक है तो डिस्कनेक्ट करना है अभी ठीक है ठीक है so I am talking about you know the area of the Harappans uh, from this map uh, you can get the idea 
we can get idea about the total area of the Harappan, you know, Harappan uh, the culture. Uh, and you know that you know this particular part is very important. The Gagar Hakra River Basin, which is identified as the Saraswati Basin. Now this part is very important because nearly two thirds of the Harappan settlements located so far, they are located in this particular area. So very vast area was really you know brought under occupation of uh, Harappan people, which is located in the desert part of uh, Gujarat, in Kutch part of Gujarat. There is a small island called Khadir Island on which this site is located. So these are the you know five Harappan cities, and uh, as I mentioned earlier that. Uh, we have reconstructed the history of the Harappans on the basis of data coming from Harappa, Mohenjadro, Dolavira, and Rakhigadi. So it is certainly, you know, not the, you know, complete reconstruction of the Harappan lifestyle. Then also, I can uh, let me tell you that you know the Harappans were not the only people living that time in the Indian subcontinent. You can see from this map, you can get clear cut idea that entire Indian subcontinent was under occupation. The Harappa Hello. Okay. So, uh, sorry for the disturbance. Huh? No, twenty minutes. Can finish or can I? No, it will take more time. Okay, okay. Uh, so I'm just, you know, I want to show this slide to uh, indicate, you know, some of the important sites, you know, that have been excavated in fact in the Saraswati Basin. And also you can see the location of the site of Rakhigadi. So, you know, what I should know, since the site, you know, we have limited time, uh, I will just, you know, rush up a little bit. But, you know, you may be wondering, you know, why, you know, the Saraswati Basin was so important for the Harappans. And from this you know, uh, slide, you can get the idea that this is one of the most fertile units in fact in the world. And you can see, you know, this uh, is also well watered because of the fertility of the region and well water, you know, area. The Harappans have prepared this particular. And, you know, the rivers are not really ferocious like Indus River. Indus River, you know, gets frequent floods and uh, the settlements you know, are frequently, you know, threatened by the floods. But here, you know, the rivers are very safe and also the area is very, very fertile and well watered. Because of that, we get large number of sites. Now, in this map, you know, you can see the uh, location of the, I'm coming to the site of Rakhigadi now. Uh, Rakhigadi is located on the, one of the major tributaries of Saraswati, that, that is Dushyadwati. And today the Dushyadwati is known as Chautang River. So this is the course of that river. Uh, which is reconstructed, and you can see the location of there are different mounds, different uh, you know maybe localities of the Harappans at the site of Rakhigadi, and uh, the earlier scholars had identified seven localities, and we have discovered two more localities. So there are nine localities. Uh, so this is the area, the map of the location of the uh, different Harappan. Mounts at the site of Rakhigadi, and this is the you know the uh, aerial photograph of the site of Rakhigadi, the main part of the site of Rakhigadi. You can see the open area that you are seeing here. This is the part 
uh, which is you know protected by the archaeological Service of india this part this part also is protected by the archaeological Service of india whereas you know there's a mound here you know which is not visible which is under the modern uh, occupation so there is one more maybe locality here and maybe the most important part of the uh, locality is here this is called mound number 4 and today almost you know 5000 people are living on this particular mound so we know that on you know, this particular mound cannot be excavated so this gives you idea about you know the uh, site and a lot of people may be, may be wondering you know uh, what is the nature of the site now ancient sites particularly from the beginning of the settled life till you know the you know maybe modern times the ancient sites are in the form of mounds like this you can see here this is a part of the mound and this are the artificial artificial mounds formed because of the human activities and here you know people have lived at one and the same spot maybe you now for 3000 years or 4000 years because of these activities people you know this type of mounds have formed in fact at the end of the settlement people have deserted the site and then what your structures were there in fact you know, they started falling and because of the wind and in you know, other activities you know they were covered you know by the soil and ultimately you now we see this type of mounds and we explain you know, or excavate this type of mounds and we get you know the the traces of the human activities in these mounds and there are different levels in fact you know which maybe you can see in the next slide uh this is the you know part of the mount uh, which is mount number 4 you can see quite high this part and this is mount number 2 of course we did some excavation here and this is the portion of the site which is cut by the people but we can from this you can see the nature of the archaeological mounds firstly though the color of the soil is whitish here you can see that people are walking you can see the white in you know, a white trail here and here i don't know whether you can see but there are different levels we can see so these levels indicate different generations at one and the same site uh, occupied up generation after generation so this how the ancient mounds look like and then as i mentioned that you know we did some scientific studies uh, we employed some uh, latest geophysical methods to record the on a site with the total area of the site so this was one method you know by which you know we prepared the maps we used the total station which, which is very advanced method for recording this type of landscape so we have done that and uh, we have generated you know good maps of the site so in this uh, picture you can see this is the satellite imagery of the uh, of the site of the bull village and you can see the 3d 3d creation of the uh, contour maps of the uh, ancient site and in the lower map you can see more or less the total area so this is a large area in fact which was occupied by the harappans only small portion of that is surviving today the gray portion that you can see you see in the in the picture here that is the area which is under the modern occupation so you can imagine how much the area is under the modern occupation and the area on the periphery outside that is all flattened by the farmers they have converted the site into agricultural field so in that process a lot of portion has been destroyed uh then also you now we did uh, the scientific uh, uh we wanted to understand you know, the different activity areas on different mounds because there are seven nine mounds and what activities were carried out in each mound that we wanted to you know understand and there is a method called you know, sampling method so we you know we have and you know, graded the entire site or you know, the part of the site you know which is visible and which is intact only that part is you know properly graded and we believe you know whatever remains are found on the surface they give some idea about what activities were carried out in bed immediately below that so we have got you know quite good success in that so we did this first uh, on the surface and later you now we got some uh, some evidence like this you know we have got the evidence about the different activities we you know presume maybe you know get here 
then you know a lot of you know details about the carnelian carnelian working about the copper working the distribution of the pottery so from that you know we can date you know even distribution of the terracotta bangles and other material from that you know, we can utilize perhaps you know which part of the site was made for the manufacturing purpose and later you know we carried out the excavation we made the hypothesis on the basis of the surface collection first and later you know we carried out the excavation of the site and you know they we found that you know, most of our hypothesis that was built on the basis of surface collection you know it come out you know turn out to be true and uh, i was also mentioning about you know the other method the ground penetration radar meter you know which we did at the site of rakigiri and this is a very you know you, look, you know this instrument looks small but it scans the you know the you know, vertical area of the site and you know the scanning can be effective uh, to a depth of 25 meters so we could get some idea by doing this you know we have scanned the whole site and we could get idea about you know the nature of the evidence you know that is likely to be found in the lower levels or underground and also to support this particular we also undertook undertook the electric electrical resistivity survey and from that also you know we can get some idea about you know the nature of the structures or the features below the you know uh, ground which is not visible so what we did in fact we uh, set up a total station of this uh, our gpr station in fact at the site and uh, we used that you know for receiving the that particular instrument which you saw that sense the you know maybe you know uh, transmission in the in the ground and then of course we have a receiver here we get the idea what you know what is the you know what is the nature of the structures below where whenever there is a structure or feature you know you get different uh, maybe you know uh, wave there and that is how you know we come to know that there is some feature there and then of course we receive that you know in our receiver and then you know we have the control system and that data is passed on to our laptop and then finally you know we get these type of uh, features perhaps you know from this you can make out but certainly you know we can make out you know the photo the like today you know like here in fact you know, we you know we can see a big building in fact you know below the ground which is not visible from the surface and this particular feature could be identified only because of the survey that we undertook at the site so this modern methods were used uh, on a very large scale and this is how you know and we know that you know mount number 4 which is the most pa- important part of the site now that cannot be you know excavated but to get idea about you know the different activities carried out on that particular mount we are using this vertical gpr survey on very large scale gpr and the and the elect- electricity resistivity survey and uh, from that certainly you know without excavation also we can try to understand the different activity areas and uh, maybe we can try to get as much information as possible for by using this particular method so we are using this you know, method at the site of rakigiri then the next problem that was the you know to, to study the uh, transition from early harappan to the you know harappan civilization phase and here you know we can see maybe i don't know Uh, from this we can get the idea we did one what is called as the index trench uh, we started you know on top of the mound and you know we dug it to till the natural level which is here so the total deposit is almost 2400 24 meter deposit here and no other harappan site uh, has such a thick deposit hello but now it is no 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 let's continue as long as you know it is working no this can it can it baad fir fir se reconnect kar sakte hain usko ha theek hai theek hai to you you like that so you let me know so i was uh, discussing about you know the nature of the evidence uh, structural evidence in the lower most levels you know which is like this you know in the form of the pit dwellings circular pit dwellings or circular huts 
that is how it the harappans began in fact their lifestyle in fact in the early stage and in the next stage uh, they built all ground structures like rectangular structures and now you also you can see maybe this is a part of the bathroom and you can see the use of the typical harappan bricks in the ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 3 even the harappan in you know, uh, this uh, tandu uh, exactly same tandu continue to today so this type of you know there is a you know gradual transition from maybe the pit dwellings to these structures and then of course you know in the next level of course it becomes a well planned settlement you can see here uh, the evidence uh, from the site of farmana this indicates you know that you know, at some stage there is a modicum of planning and typical harappan planning in fact comes into existence and then of course i will show you the typical harappan planning in fact coming into existence a full fledged harappan urbanization full fledged harappan city well developed cities with uh, north south and east west running main streets streets small streets lanes by lanes and structures on either side of this streets and lanes and by lanes so this is the evidence that we find in fact you know, there is a gradual growth in the you know structural activities so from simple pit dwellings you know the journey to the well planned cities is really you know, a very long journey and we have evidence in fact in this respect then also you know we carried out uh, uh, this is the limited excavation in fact you know, we did at the site of rakigadi to check you know whether the you know whether the hypothesis that we have built on the basis of the surface collection whether that is true or not and then you know we found that you know, we had hypothesized hypothesize that you know the mound number 2 was the main uh, craft manufacturing area and in the excavation you know, we found you know actually in different levels uh, the uh, you know furnaces and the platforms working platforms a very strong evidence about the manufacturing activities in that particular area so these are the close up of that uh, also we found one part of the granary at the site of rakigadi which uh, you know, we have excavated partially but you can see you know, most of the structures at rakigadi they are made of uh, only mud brick structures the burn bricks are used only for the drainage and the wells at the site not for the for building the walls of the structures so this is also important evidence that we find at the site of rakigadi and then of course you know, the transition also is visible in fact in their uh, ceramic also the pottery this is the kind of pottery that we get in fact in the early levels and uh, very crude and handmade uh, in between of course it is, it becomes close to the harappan pottery this is the pottery from the middle level uh, of the uh, early harappan and then it is transformed into a proper classical harappan pottery in the beginning of the harappan harappan civilization phase so this is how you know there is a transition in the ceramic also so this similar transition is uh, also being studied in their other uh, material culture like you know beads in their bangles seals and ceilings so that is you know going on but at least these two examples give idea that you know the harappan civilization has develop gradually uh, from the earlier harappan phase so the earlier harappan phase is considered to be the uh, to be the uh, formative stage of the harappan culture and then i come to the most important part about uh, the excavation of the cemetery at rakigadi the cemetery is usually located 1 km away from the settlement and here you know, we did a uh, very systematic and scientific excavation of the burial in fact now we did not succeed in getting dna from the uh, from the cemetery at farmana because you know maybe our methods were you know maybe not correct and that you know we have taken care of those methods and we have changed our strategy at the site of rakigadi so what we did you know we have of course you know this is the area of the cemetery but what we did you know, we we took proper precaution before the excavation i will suggest that you know any burial site uh, should be excavated by taking this type of precaution which we have not taken you know at the site of farmana so this is not a corona you know warrior in fact uh, he is uh, more like a rakigadi dna warrior 
and we have taken really proper precaution. We have used this type of you know head cap, goggle and mask, then disposal gowns, disposal gloves and gloves, and uh, also you know one maybe brush and tool uh, separate for this burial. The same tools will not use for the other burials for the excavation, and we use you know plastics for keeping the bones. And what we did in fact, we excavated the burial. Uh, we did not excavate the entire cemetery at one and the same time. We excavated the 40 burials, but one by one. So we were advised to you know, use this type of, take this type of precaution. And then of course, you know, we were also, uh, we also took proper precaution for, the, uh, for uh, preventing any contamination of the site. And by using this, uh, we have excavated all the burials. So these are the warriors uh, at Rakigadi who are excavating the burials. And uh, because we took the precaution very, you know, uh, my detailed precaution of the excavation to prevent any kind of contamination, we were finally, you know, successful in getting DNA. So while excavating, you know, we have taken the precaution. Then we also did a lot of uh, collection of the samples. This is how the you know various uh, the, the uh, skeletal remains look like some of, in some of the burials. We do not have you know complete burials in all the burials, all the pits, but some of the burials are quite intact. Then of course you know I'm not going to discuss you know in detail, but uh, we had published an article about the uh, the Harappan lovers, in fact, probably husband and wife. So this is the that burial. Maybe because of shortage of time, I'm not able to discuss this in, in detail. But this is a close-up of that burial. So we get you know number of different kinds of burial. There are some quite rich burial, quite some are quite poor, poor in terms of you know the material that is placed around, around the dead bodies. So in some cases we find maybe one or two pots. In some cases like this, we find number of pots. So that denotes the social status or the economic status of the person. So this type of evidence is found uh, at the side of Rakigadi and also other Harappan sites. We also had, you know, plan B. Suppose we fail in getting DNA from the Harappan skeletal remains. Then we have done very, you know, detailed sampling. And it is usually believed that, you know, that after the death, uh, every human being has uh, the parasite eggs in the body. And after the death, the parasite eggs survive. And the Koreans have really, you know, they have uh, extracted, extracted these, you know, parasite eggs from the ancient burials, and they have reconstructed the DNA of the person. So we also wanted to collect the samples, and uh, you know, we have not really, you know, left uh, any stone unturned. So whatever is possible, we are done at the site of Rakigadi. But my suggestion that you know, at every burial site, one should take proper precaution. One should do this type of you know, detailed sampling. And once, you know, these, you know, these samples are brought to the laboratory, we send these, you know, samples to the, they can call it laboratory. And then also, you know, for, you know, maybe uncovering, for maybe cleaning them, we have taken the same precaution as we did in fact in the field. So this type of precaution is very much required because otherwise the modern DNA, DNA of the, you know, modern people can, can easily get into the DNA of the, ancient people. So we wanted to avoid that at the site of Rakhigri. And we did, you know, this type of, you know, systematic study, right? You know, the samples were transported to the Deccan College Laboratory. There we did, you know, the entire anthropological examination. We have already done this. We have published part of that. Then we also have done the CT scanning because CT scanning data is very much required for reconstructing the facial feature of the Harappans. That is called the craniofacial reconstruction of the Harappans. Then also we did the you know paleoparasitology sampling, uh, which was not successful, but you know we have done sampling that. And then of course the samples that we have extracted, they were used for DNA analysis, DNA extraction. We finally you know succeeded in getting DNA from you know one or two skeletal remains, and also we have done the stable isotope analysis. From the stable isotope analysis, we can talk about you know the health of the people and also about the diet of the people. So this is what you know we have done, and there is so much information that one can extract from the ancient uh, skeletal remains. 
not only that you know, we get a lot of data in fact in the in the uh, burials but from the bones also the bones can be you know subjected to the various uh, scientific exa examinations anal analysis and they provide really a lot of data for understanding the health diet and what the people so that is what you know, we have done in fact at the site of Bakigari. Then this is a sample, you know, which, uh, you know, this is the lady, uh, burial of a lady around 35 years old. And this lady has given us a very strong DNA. In fact, we have found DNA in other skeletal remains, which are very faint. The signatures are so big that, you know, we were not able to get any, maybe insight from those uh, samples. But uh, finally, you know, we got very strong DNA from this. And from that, you know, we can make a lot of assumptions. This lady is quite tall, uh, her, was beautiful because she has a very sharp features and probably from a very affluent family because you can see so many parts around uh, the dead body. So probably she had very good status in maybe economic status as well as social status in the society. And the analysis that we did in fact, I would like to you know maybe mention about this. Uh, you know, uh, Usually it was believed that the Aryans came from outside, uh, from the steppe region. And you know, they came into the Indian subcontinent. And these are the people who developed the Harappan culture and the Vedic culture. Uh, also, there was hypothesis that you know, maybe some people came from the Anatolia region. Those people came here and they developed the agriculture here. So that is all really though not true. So what we have found in fact, you know, the genetically steppe integration in South Asia has not happened uh, uh, until 1000 BC. After 1000 BC, we get more maybe maybe people coming in large number after 1000 BC, but not before that. Furthermore, mixing the steppes was gradual and not sudden, thus reject the invasion or the replacement of the local South Asian with the steppes. Steppes have arrived to India and mixed with the local population and exchanged their, their genetic material, but not the ancestry, knowledge, and the culture. What is interesting that you know the ancestry which was developed here that has remained intact, you know, from the beginning till the till modern times. And at no stage the ancestry was disconnected or broken at any stage. So that is also important. We have also observed that there was a great deal of variance due to differential mixing with diverse local populations. The increase of steps, steppes in South is probably due to much concentration of steppes at the region after 1000 BC. Steppes are the far, you know, maybe pastoral from the Central Asia. We are also ruling out large scale spread of farmers with Anatolian roots into South Asia on the basis of the DNA research. The centerpiece of the Anatolian hypothesis that movement of people from the West brought farming into this region and with it, the Indo European languages. Since no substantial movement of the people occurred, this is checkmate for the Anatolian hypothesis. One mistake that we have done, in fact, in both the papers, uh, paper which is published in Science and Sail, is that we have mentioned that you know that the Indo-European languages were brought after 2000 BC. This you know we, because we do not have the any evidence about the origin date of the origin of the Indo-European language. Also, we do not know where exactly the Indo-European languages are originated, but you know we have gone with the flow, and we have mentioned that now we are we realize that that is a mistake that we have done in fact in, in both the papers. We are also ruling out large-scale spread of farmers. That is okay. Then uh, also uh, in this uh, in this uh, cell paper, you see that. The ancestry, distinct ancestry of South Asians was developed around 12, 000, one, maybe 10,000 BC, around 12,000 years ago. What happens you know, the hunter gatherers at this stage, they broke into two you know, branches. One went to Iran and there they got mixed up with the Anatolian farmers. And one came to South India, South Asia. And here, you know, of course, you know, we have some, you know, since both the groups have the common ancestry, we find in some elements of that common, but here they were, you know, the, you know the developing a distinct ancestry, and that ancestry has survived in fact in the Andaman, Andaman area. The Andaman is today, 
they are the real you know maybe indigenous people of south asia so it is surviving so what we get in fact you know around 12000 years ago uh, the distinct south asian ancestry was developed and then that ancestry continues you know till the harappan period and from harappan till modern times so in rakigadi samples we found out that the harappans were not carrying any genetic signature from iranian related ancestry not from uh, steppe related ancestry this is extremely fascinating and indicative that agriculture in south asia was invented and practiced by the indigenous population this sets aside the previous belief that farming was brought by neolithic iranians it is also evident that significant movement of harappans was towards the central asia for the first time we are reporting out of india theory on the basis of the presence of harappan like ancestry in turkmenistan and iran iranian population contemporary to the mature harappan you know uh, period this discovery has potential to start claiming about the out of india theory this is very important because you know we always believe that the you know aryans came from maybe central asia or, or iran but uh, this study indicates that you now before the aryans or before the so called aryans in fact the harappans began to move out of india first because you know we have in the uh, turkmenistan uh, skeletal remains at the site of golur and at the site of shari sokta in iran uh, both of them these two sites were contributed to the harappans and the harappans had very good contact with both the both the regions we found the harappan ancestry in those skeletal remains but not their ancestry in fact in the harappan skeletal remains that means you know the harappans had a very distinct ancestry and when they began to move towards iran and then to towards uh, central asia they got mixed up with the local population and that is how the harappan you know ancestry is found in their skeletal remains but not here so this is very very important then genetic results indicate that vedic knowledge was indigenous and not brought by the so called indo aryans so just you know to give some hints about this so south asia perhaps in, in the world in fact now is very distinct area different populations were generated all these people in fact what you see you know different people uh, they have the same ancestry the entire south asian population they carried her ancestry from andaman to uh, kashmir and from afghanistan to you know bengal or majority of the south asians you know they carry a very strong her ancestry and this different you know maybe you know appearance happen in fact in the indian subcontinent mainly because of maybe the landscape because of the climate because of the food habit this different land you know different uh, appearances have, have occurred in the indian subcontinent but perhaps you know india has such a diverse population right from the you know beginning and uh, you know this this is the region you know which is you know broadly you know under the south asian population in fact and south asian ancestry the andamanese you know the uh, dravidians uh, you know which are large area then astro asiatic and so called indo european or indo aryan so all of them have the common ancestry we do not know much about this region because we are working on that part so this map gives you idea of what you know the location of the site of gonur in central asia where you know some of the skeletal remains were excavated so we have dna from some of the skeletal remains from gonur and in their skeletal remains we find harappan you know ancestry harappan genome and the site of shari sokta in iran in shari sokta also we see the harappan genome but not the harappan you know their genome impact in the harappan population so that is very important and that indicates that perhaps the harappans first began to out began to go out and there is later maybe reciprocal movement happening uh, in the larger area then i move to the next important part that is the facial reconstruction of the hello नहीं नहीं खत्म नहीं 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 अभी थोड़ा एक दस मिनट का और पार्ट है नहीं 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 स्लाइड्स आ गए स्लाइड का मैं दिखा रहा हूँ स्लाइड्स में एक मिनट
Eight, I might, I'll just go. Uh, can you see now? The guy there, Ami. Okay, now you know. I will talk about the facial reconstruction that we have done. Uh, this of course done in collaboration with the uh, Korean scientist. And for the facial reconstruction, of course, we need complete you know, skeletal remains. And fortunately, we have done. You know, we have some skeletal remains. You know, which are quite good, quite intact. And uh, you can see the close-up of the facial feature of the you know skeletal remains that we excavated. So this is a you know 18 year male, a boy, and uh, we also have a 45 year old woman in fact here. You can see a complete skeletal remain of a woman, which is around 45 years old. So we have done the facial reconstruction of both in fact these. And before the facial reconstruction, of course, we need the you know this type of MRI scanning data. We need scanning data. For, to understand the inner morphology of the you know skeletal remains, and also we need you know the entire you know, we need the complete detailed uh, measurements of each and every bone which we have done, and then of course you know, that was fed in the computer, and finally the computer had generated the facial feature of the reference. For the first time, you are able to see the uh, facial reconstruction of the Harappan people here. This is the, you know, maybe reconstructed uh, skull of the boy. And then slowly, slowly, you now we started putting uh, the muscle and the flesh on that. And finally, the skin is put on that. So this is how the boy looks like. And same is the case with the 45-year-old woman. Uh, same, you know, they were adopted. And this is the facial feature of the woman. And both of them, they look exactly like the modern people in Haryana. So there is a continuity in fact in the appearance. We have done more of course now because of the uh, short of time, I'm not going to discuss all this, uh, but I'm just, I wanted to show this uh, evidence before the first time that we have done this in the facial reconstruction of the Harappan people. And you can see that boy exactly looks like, you know, the modern boy looks like the Harappan boy and uh, the Harappan woman and the modern woman look like exactly the same. So there is a continuity in that. We have also done a lot of uh, uh, this uh, outreach program about which I'm not going to discuss, but finally I would, I would like to discuss about the broad conclusions. One is that Harappan culture and civilization developed by the Indian people about which of course I mentioned. There is no Aryan invasion or migration. There's a movement of the people of course happening uh, from all directions. People from maybe from Mesopotamia, from Iran in, you know, maybe Gulf region from Stepi region, they were coming and going, right? they were doing business with the Harappans. And there was a lot of mixing happening in fact in the Indian subcontinent. But at no stage, the South Asian ancestry was replaced or discontinued at any stage. So that ancestry which was developed maybe 12,000 years ago, that continues to today. That means, you know, there was no maybe large scale invasion or, or migration of the people at any stage. So this is very important. Uh, so we also can develop, you know, the out of India hypothesis. We need more data, of course, for this, uh, which we are generating. So neither Stepi's, Stepi's pastoral nor Iranian farmers contributed to the development of South Asian ancestry. Ancestry is different and mixing is different. Mixing was happening, but the ancestry was not really you know, impacted by the mixing of the people or from different regions. The major South Asians today are the descendants of the Harappans. And archaeological as well as genetic evidence indicate continuity to today. I wanted to discuss this continuity also in detail, but that also maybe I will not be able to do that. But what is interesting that you know that we have not really forgotten the Harappan uh, material culture, the Harappan traditions, and even the Harappan lifestyle. So people today, in fact, at Rakiri, you know, they connect themselves to the, you know, to the roots uh, which go back to the Harappan times. And this is almost in the entire Harappan region. And uh, perhaps, you know, India is one of the few countries in fact in the world where we connect ourselves to the past, to our very past 
and we connect to our roots. And in India, the roots are going back to the Rappan tribes. Even today, now, if you move around the Rakhigiri village, you will get the impression that perhaps you are moving in the Harappan village because the settlement arrangement is exactly like the Harappan you know, uh, settlement arrangement. Even the material culture used by the people today, they're exactly like the material culture used by the earlier people, by the Harappans. They're producing the same kind of pottery even today. They're producing the same kind of Harappan-like beads even today. And a lot of Harappan crafts even continue today. There are a lot of communities in South Asia today who are following the Harappan, what I call as the uh, knowledge system. And they're dependent on this knowledge system. So it is important that you know, we understand this knowledge system and we pass on the uh, knowledge that you know, we have generated to the people you know, to make their life you know, much better. This is what you know, we are doing. And uh, you know, because of this, you know, we, uh, say we, we feel that, you know, that we have been able to contribute immensely to the Harappan history. So uh, I will also mention that you know, we have developed the rakhigiri.com site website, which will be available soon. We also have the Facebook, you know, the details are available on this. We also have the you know, YouTube channel for the Rakhigiri. We are also on you know, Twitter and also on Instagram. So you can use this you know, links to get more maybe information from the site of Rakhigiri. But in brief, uh, I, I have given you some idea I'm sorry for the discontinuity and the you know, disturbance happening because of which maybe some of the uh, important data that I was not able to uh, share with you. But uh, I thank again the organizers. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Yeah, yeah. So I'll stop that now. I am visible now. Yeah, I'll be happy to take some questions. If anybody has some questions, I'll be happy to take them. No, we we have we are not. I know somebody somebody asked the question about the chariot discovery of the chariot, but and the way the culture. Of, no, we are not talking about you know the discovery. So uh, we are not talking. We are not really found any chariot. We are not claiming that here. Uh, the archaeological survey of India has excavated the site called Sanauli. And there, you know, they have discovered a chariot in the burial. But I'm not discussing about that. In, in Rakhigari, we have not found any evidence of that. What is important here that you know, we have done the, you know, the facial reconstruction and the DNA studies. And that is giving us, you know, very, you know, very useful information about the implication of this particular research on the Indian history. So we are talking about that. I'm not, I have not discussed anything about the Vaitik culture also here. So maybe, you know, in next lecture, maybe I will talk about that in general. Apart from uh, 
Okay. Uh, uh, Shailaja, Shailaja Rani has asked me the question. Uh, what are the other techniques that we have used for the you know for understanding the uh, maybe uh, statistical analysis of the data or you know the of the collection of data? Now let me tell you that you know we I have not given you a lot of details about that, but the sampling you know will be did. In fact, now we have collected the data from each and every uh, three, and we have detailed analyzed. We have done the detailed analysis of the data from that, and we have. Also, the statistical data of the pottery uh, and also other material culture, about which I was not I was not able to talk today in great detail. But we have a lot of data data available, and that data is helping us in understanding the maybe the distribution of the material, uh, their concentration within the site, and that is also helping us in understanding the different activity areas uh, that uh, we have done. Okay, you know, uh, those. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, those who know who have questions, you know, they might uh, maybe write to me anytime. I will be happy to reply them. Also, you know, you can write on the uh, rakigadi.com website also, and uh, certainly we will, we will be happy to supply you uh, information that you require. But uh, I, I take this opportunity on my behalf. I take this opportunity to, to thank all of you for uh, coming online. And I also thank the uh, Nehru Science Center uh, for organizing this lecture. In fact, Nehru, as I mentioned in the initial stage, that Nehru Science Center is doing really you know, great work. And uh, they're trying to reach the knowledge system, in fact, to every household. And this is the important effort that they're doing. I, I will appeal all of you, in fact, you know, those who are uh, listening to me, watching me, that you sometimes you visit the Nehru Science Center, there you can get to know, uh, or rather no, there, there you can see in the exhibition of the uh, various scientific development that we have done, and also the, uh, the uh, contemporary view of the ancient knowledge system that you know, we have been discussing. So you should visit them, and I'm sure that you, know, you get a good idea. Uh, day after tomorrow, Monday, on Monday, there is a, a very important talk by uh, Dr. Anil Kapodkar, uh, well known scientist, scientist of the country, on behalf of the Nehru Science Center. So uh, you will be really you know, glad to see him also, and you'll be able to get a lot of information from him. So I, I hope that all of you will also watch that important program on 11 at 11 o'clock. Uh, so this again, organized by Sci Nehru Science Center. So again, you know, I thank all of you. I thank the Nehru Sci Science Center. And I thank you.